Hi there and welcome to the eighth official installment of the Sage Running Podcast. We have a special guest on the show tonight, uh, two-time Olympian, Mike Aish. Mike, welcome to the show. Cheers. Uh, yeah, and thanks so much for, for agreeing to, to get on here. Um, you've had an amazing running career from running shorter distance, relatively shorter distances on the track to moving up to doing the big ultras, Leadville, Leadman. Uh, training a ridiculous amount, which we'll talk about, uh, as well as your transition from you know road marathons track into the trail ultra running scene, uh, and just you know all around great guy. So really excited uh, to talk to you about that. Uh, just for the the listeners out there, Mike has run twenty seven forty six. Is that right? Twenty seven forty six for ten k. Right around the ten thousand yeah. meters and uh, thirteen twenty two for five k. And for you non-math majors, that's uh, I believe that's under 4:30 per mile pace. It's a 425 per mile for the 10k. It's it's around there. Um, <laughs> I think it was like 66 seconds or like something like that. So. so yeah, 425 per mile pace for 6.2 miles in a row. I can't even. That's hard yeah. for me to wrap my head around that. I can I can keep up with you for a mile and a half on the track maybe <laughs> during your 10k. Uh, and you made the Olympics twice too. So it, I mean, 2000. In 2004 Olympic Games, as well as running a 213 road marathon when you dabbled in the, the road scene a bit. Um, but this past summer, you did the Ledman uh, race series, the Ledman 100, and I have to refresh my memory here. It was a 5K, half marathon, marathon, 50 mile. <laughs> Did it's I do that wrong? No, I said it's, that wrong. it's getting bigger and bigger. Oh. Um, <laughs> it's sick. It started off as a marathon, um, then it went to a 50. A 50 mile, mm -hmm. um, then a 100 mile bike, a uh, 10k run, and then a 100 mile run. Oh wow! Um, and those last three, um, the bike, the 10k, and the the run were all in, uh, within a week. So it it, uh, it was it was fun, but uh, yeah, it was bloody stuff by the end. Yeah, and you ended up getting second overall in the whole. Yeah, whole yeah, shebang. I um I was gunning for that that top spot, but uh, I had a horrible run, and uh, I just just barely hung on to second place so yeah. uh, it worked out good but uh you know you always want to do a little better yeah and you and then you've also done the the leadville 100 as a regular race as well as other races like the tarawera 100k new zealand um and the north face 50 mile champs as well as other 50 mile ultras uh, over the last several years yeah the last probably five years um i was lucky enough that i could dabble in the in the trails and and, and really enjoy it. Um, I don't think a lot of people realize that, you know, I class myself as a, I was always a track runner, but uh, I always trained on, on the trails. So it was really nothing new. Um, it was just the duration and, and, and just trying to, you know, get my body used to being out there for that long. So, uh, you know, the trails were fun and the community was fantastic. And, you know, I, I loved it. It was, it was a great way to kind of like finish off a career. Yeah, well, quite a career you had. So we'll rewind a bit here and we'll start, uh, from your roots, you came over from New Zealand uh, when you were for college, basically. You were recruited um, to run at Western State out in Gunnison, Colorado. And before that, you were uh, coached by legendary coach Arthur Lydiard. Tell us a little bit about that or you yeah, know, when you started um, running in New Zealand. So I, I started uh, basically running just to get a day off school. Um, for the, the school cross country, you got you got the day off. Um, then that kind of led to me kind of hooking up with some local guys, um, and they took me under their wing and, and, and basically taught me the basics and, and you know help keep it fun. Um, from there, you know I, I banged into Arthur, and, and honestly, I was working in a running store, and, and he rolled in one day, and I had no idea who this guy was, and <laughs> it ended up that you know he started helping me out, to, you know, and we did a lot of it through correspondence and, and stuff like that. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I, I kind of got to the point in my life where there just wasn't a lot going on. Um, and uh, I got offered a lot of uh, scholarships to a lot of big Division One schools. And, and Western State was just, 
I don't know, it, was, it had the best art program, it was a nice small school in the mountains and um, you know, it just seemed like a good fit. So uh, yeah, I took it and, and I never regretted it once. And you had quite a career there, I believe it was 12 NCAA national titles, uh, as well as, that's when you started really ramping up your training, right? 150 yeah. miles a week. <laughs> Thing, the, the first year was a bit rough trying to get used to, uh, you know, the U.S. way of doing things. But, um, you know, I think I just kind of, like, figured, well, these, these other guys, they got two legs and, and, and two arms and they're running fast. So I wanted to test myself. And, yeah, I, I kind of ramped up the mileage to see how high I could get. And it, it got pretty high for, you know, small segments of time. And, and you know, Gunnison's small, too. There's not a lot to do. So if I wasn't at school or working, I was... I was running, so it, it worked out good. Yeah, and were the other guys on the team kind of like following your lead too, or how was the program? It was a generally a high mileage program. I mean, they're still a really good team. Yeah, when I came in, um, it was kind of at a crossroads. Um, and, uh, you know, I I started kind of like noticing that there was a few things that had kind of been kind of stuck in there that we didn't really know why we were doing it. And um, I was lucky enough that I had such a, a big background in running that, um, you know, I asked the, the coach if I could uh, help out a little. And then um, it got to the point where, you know, he worked out, he was a better, you know, facilitator and, and, and he was the organizer and, and I took over, you know, all of the workouts and the running. And, um, you know, when you're writing the workouts and you're doing the workouts and you're running well, it's really easy for everybody to get on board. And then, you know, we started winning and um, and I think we had, eight years of, of national titles and, and being one of the best, you know, doesn't matter division, you know, like teams in the, in the country. And um, it was just the right group of guys, the right time. Um, and, you know, we, we just, we didn't, we didn't see ourselves as a small division two school, you know, we were, we were competing with all the D1 guys and, you know, a lot of cases we were smashing them up too. Oh yeah. Wow. And yeah, Gunnison's, I mean, it's, what is it, 7,000 feet of elevation? Uh, it's just about 8,000 yeah. 8, feet, so yeah, and it, mm -hmm. and it does get fairly cold there in the western slope. Yeah. <laughs> the winters, it's kind of out in the plains, just south of Crested Butte, though, so you do have access to some really high mountains. Yeah, we had great trails, but in winter, sometimes it'd be negative 30 all day. Negative 30? Yeah, so oh, it, wow. was, uh, <laughs> it was testing at times, but you know, maybe that, that held us back, and that's why, you know, a lot of us didn't get injured and stuff like that. Wow, just a real strong work ethic. It seems like reading back some articles, you know, you see that later on you've maybe used uh, your 12 national, some of your running plaques and trophies as firewood once, one night maybe. Um, no idea what you're talking about there. Um, I won't admit to nothing, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't have many of them left. Um, they've all seemed to have disappeared. Yeah, yeah, not a materialistic guy. Yeah. Just doing it for the, the pure strong work ethic and the well, satisfaction of, of like running to the max yeah you're really pushing the envelope it was just about testing yourself and um you know things worked out well but uh you know i was at those races so i i didn't see the point carrying around these you know boxes of you know knickknacks for you know five ten years before i could actually find a place to hang them up so yeah i i got rid of them most yeah. of them i might have one or two yeah and then you know working super hard the ultimate goal of a lot of athletes is to make the Olympic Games. I mean, it's like the dream you have as a, as a child, as a kid uh, growing up. And you made two Olympics in Sydney and uh, Athens, right? Yeah, right? so, yeah, yeah Sydney, um, Sydney was the games that I, you know, I was as, as excited. I was this young kid and, and I, out of nowhere I, I popped this really fast time and and you know, I, I managed to get myself on the team. I didn't know until two weeks before the games, so I kind of kept racing and racing, and and I just kind of blew myself apart. Um, so the the result wasn't it wasn't good, wasn't it was terrible actually. Um, but you know, there was a lot that went into that, and and you know, I kind of vowed to myself, you know, I wanted to I wanted to redeem myself. So that set off that drive for the next four years, and um, you know, I just pushed up the training harder and, and raced, you know, harder and, and, you know, I got the chance to get selected again and, um, you know, I think all that, that, that kind of pushing to the limit and, and doing everything I could caught up to me again. So, uh, you know, I was, I was there for the experience and, and those Olympic Games were the reward for those four years of, of hard work. Um, 
you know, I never came away with, you know, a great place or a great medal or, and, you know, it's fun with me because, you know, just walking in an opening ceremony, it, it justified, you know, every morning I got up at like, you know, four o'clock, five o'clock to go running before classes and, and things like that. So you actually, this was, did it overlap with your college career? No yeah. Thinks, so, oh, wow, that's really impressive. I was like, <laughs> I think I was a sophomore in college for Sydney. Wow. So that definitely helped with the team. Um, I remember coming back and I had like three or four, you know, big roller bags full of clothes from all the different, you know, like companies and I just laid them out and, and you know, I think I sold some of them to help pay my rent and uh, I gave <laughs> the rest of it away, you know, and, and all the guys on the team were just about the same shoe size. So. Uh, oh, nice. Yeah, and no, it worked out good. Yeah, that's very generous of you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's, to run that fast, I, I just couldn't imagine. You were doing quality workouts with this high mileage too, right? Running. Yeah, so um, yeah. I don't know what's happened today. You know, when I was work, you know, training at my best, I, I was running three hard workouts a week. You wow. know, and I don't know if many people still do that. Yeah. And you know, I learned that from you know the other great runners, and, and they always used to you know work out hard and, and you know recover and, and then work out hard again and, and just do it as as as, as even even killed as you could. Um, yeah. You know, lots of people would say, you know, it's great to have an amazing workout, but, you know, you've got to be prepared that the next couple might be kind of crap. So, uh, you know, I always try to keep things good, but not great. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. Can you give us an example of, like, one of your tougher sessions that you um, did? And this is in the context of 140, yeah. 150 miles a week, right? Um, nothing really special. You know, just basic stuff. Um, once I did uh, 10 by quarter... Um, in Gunnison, so at just about eight thousand feet, and I ran them. <laughs> yeah, I did. Uh, so I did uh, all ten in sixty or less. Uh, sixty seconds or a less. Quarter. Yeah, with but how then, much rest? So about fifty, fifty-five seconds. And you could do sixty second. Yeah, quarter miles. but like you'd think, yeah, that's great. The it's workout went great. Pace. But yeah, <laughs> then I couldn't walk for like the next three days. I just pushed it too much. Um, a lot of my workouts were just K reps on really short rest. Everything, um, eight hundreds. I remember after I ran that uh, 1322, um, mm -hmm. me and this African were like talking about training and, and I'd beaten him and he was like, you know, I, I did the session at 800s and I was running 153s and I was like, oh, that sounds good, you know. <laughs> and then he goes, do you do 800s? And I was like, yeah. And he goes, what do you do? And I said, well, I was doing 214s. And he was like, he was looking at me all crazy and then you could just see that it clicked that, you know, I'd beaten him. Yeah. And I think that you know, the short rest is the key. You yeah. know, as long as you're running race pace, that's great. But, you know, the, the, the closer that you can, like, get those reps together and kind of simulate a race, that, that's what makes the difference. Wow. That's yeah. super impressive. Um, and you're doing some pretty long, long runs, too, in there? Or what kind um, of long runs you guys throwing down? Long run was typically two hours. It two was hours. just always two hours. Yeah. But, you know, some days we'd do it how we felt. So, you know, mm -hmm. it might be eight, nine-minute pace. Some days, yeah. if we felt good, you know, we'd... You know, we push each other a bit, but, you know, like, recovery was the key between the workouts, and the workouts mm. were always, you know, you kind of rose up for the workouts. Yeah. And then as you transitioned into, like, running on the roads, doing your 213 marathon, you probably extended some of that long run a bit, or you kept the intensity, or yeah. how was that transition? So we backed off a lot. Um, you know, one of the typical workouts would have been, like, uh, 12 by K, mm -hmm. um, 90 seconds rest. It's mm -hmm. a, you know, three minutes, three or five. Three flat, okay. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, just, uh, like, trying to maintain speed too. So, like, um, the 90 seconds would be run at six-minute pace. Mm -hmm. And uh, I did that a lot on the track just because it's easy to run, you know, 90 seconds and, 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 and kind of keep that pace constant. Um, yeah, I don't know. The marathon, I love the training and my body could handle it, but I just never really had great day you know um and it was just it just never correlated you know i remember running the 10k on the roads and, and i just i don't know if it's the bounce i used to get off the track or what but um you know i ran a 10k in like i think 28 40 on the roads wow. and, and i was pretty happy with that and, and i told my coach and and you could just hear him you know like like smiling basically saying yeah you're gonna run 27 40 on the dot yeah and you know, if I, I had one bad lap in that, that 10K, and that cost me about seven seconds. So really? it was funny how I could be exactly a minute quicker on the on the track than I was on the roads. And, um, 
you know, I, I, I always wanted a, to run a fast marathon and be known as a marathoner, but uh, um, just yank it, bash it in. Get we back don't, you. We don't want his, uh, the, pot, hey. the computer to fall yeah. off. <laughs> Sorry. They just oh, no. Yeah. They're great dogs. Um, we got but, some dogs in the in the show here yeah. for our listeners. <laughs> Um, and then how, so how did you apply that into when you started trail running? Trails. Some of that knowledge from marathoning and your track structure. Well, you know, I figured the first year, um, when I got into Leadville, it was a little bit of a bucket list thing. Um, I had no intention of, of you know, being in trail running for, for that long. And, um, I figured I'd just jump in and, and win the race and, and leave and, and just cross it off. But, uh, you know, I got that marathon training structure and I just added the long one and mm -hmm. I pushed it up to three hours and I thought yeah that's plenty and I was running you know like quick and I was having you know these these workouts I'd scaled back a little bit but you know they were still way too fast mm -hmm. and um you know like I, I ran Leadville and after about 40 miles I was I was done you know and it was a huge wake-up call and, and you know I was embarrassed and I was kind of like how did I underestimate this race and and it just gave me a whole respect for, for trails and especially the, the distance of 100. So, um, you know, that's when I kind of got more into it and, and, and wanted to go back and redeem myself and, and, and just, you know, like try and work it out. And uh, five years on, I still don't think I ever did. You know, it's, it's, it's a tough one. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I could relate to that just in my limited experience trying to do 200s this summer, you know, stepping up from 50 miles, 100K, which was already hard enough uh, to try to do, you know, Western States and Run Rabbit Run, or if I tried to do Leadville, I imagine it'd probably be the same uh, learning, ex humble, humble learning experience where sometimes, you know, things don't work out and you things get exponentially bad and it, you just kind of have a meltdown. And sometimes you could get beat by guys that have slower marathon viewers than, yeah. than you do, and it's all kind of part of the game. Uh, and obviously every course is different, but yeah, I, like, I'm still figuring out 100 milers for sure, and I don't know how long it's going to take, but it's definitely a big process. Yeah, like, would you say, and this is what I found, is that that 50-mile distance was, was so similar to a marathon in terms of training and, and, and time you had to spend on your legs, but the 100, it, it's like a whole different sport, and it's, it's grueling. Yeah, and even, like, you see guys like Max King at Leadville this year. Yeah. I mean, Max is a... He's, you know, a lot like you. You guys are both very versatile runners, very fast, especially on the track. Max has done some mount. He has more experience mountain running, like up steep stuff, cross country, you know, track, 3K, 5K. I think his 5K PR is maybe only like 1350, though, compared oh, to like, yeah, your 1320. Yeah. But, and he's in a 214 marathoner. Um, but yeah, and he's also, uh, you know, when you, move, when you move up to 100 miles, things, things do change and you can't always predict what's gonna happen yeah no, uh, he's just... he's definitely in our boat so uh i don't know i think as soon as as soon as this new generation of guys that have come through you know guys like yourself and max and you know hopefully i was counted a little bit as that can um can get it right you know i think it'll take another jump you know rob carr's got it he's got it down um mm. but uh you know we need to give him some competition you know <laughs> yeah yeah, and even yeah, like guys like Dave Laney, he's, he's about a fourteen flat five k runner yeah. and two seventeen marathoner. Uh, so yeah, it definitely helps to have that that ceiling of fitness and that experience of running maybe hundred mile weeks. Um, but yeah, putting it together on a hundred mile mountain course is a different ball game sometimes. Oh, and it can be painful too. Jeez. <laughs> yeah. No, definitely. Um, so we'll transition a little bit into the second part of the talk. Uh, talk about, well, kind of the evolution of mountain ultra trail running, but also kind of maybe, well, you've probably seen this more in the track world too, like even at the Olympic level, performance enhancing drugs in the sport of distance running, just kind of in general. Uh, I mean, it's, it's we've seen how it's been a big problem in sports like cycling and other professional sports, NFL, mm. uh, baseball, uh, but in, in distance training specifically, how does that kind of grind your gears or does it? And like, what, what do you think? Is it going to be a big problem? Well, it's definitely there, you know, and it's, it's just my opinion. Um, but, you know, I think that maybe the trail community is a little bit more naive than uh, the rest of the world. Um, 
I know I've been on a lot of runs and, and sometimes when there's not much to talk about it's a great topic to bring up because you can debate it until you're blue in the face but you know nobody really knows. Um, you know there's, there's just it's just so easy and I don't think people realize that. Um, I've, I've had friends that have well not friends people that I've, I've known that have uh, you know carried vials of uh, you know EPO across the border you know taped to the inside of their leg you know I've, I've known guys that have, you know, nicest guy, great racing, a uh, great racer, and, and, you know, then they, they come out that they've been on EPO, or, you know, and you just, I don't know, for me, you know, I knew it was there, and I understood that, and um, I kind of just figured that, you know, I'm doing this for me. Um, it, it comes down to, am I enjoying it? Am I doing it because I love it? And um, I always wanted the answer to be yeah. So, you know, you'd see these guys beat you and, and, you know, deep down you'd be like, yeah, I wonder if he's training as hard as me or if, if he's, you know, he's kind of cheating it a little bit. And, um, you know, internationally, it, it, it's, it's a big thing. You'd be in road races in Europe and you'd get beat by some guy that obviously looked 20 pounds overweight and you'd be just like, how the hell did that happen? <laughs> but, um, yeah, it, it's there. It, it'll always be there. It's human nature to, to try and one-up. Um, you know, they did it in, in, in the first Olympics. I think they were kind of wiping themselves down with, with oil and, and so they could wrestle a bit better. But, uh, yeah, as long as there's humans in the race, I, I think they'll be cheating. And, um, you know, it's sad but true. Yeah, and even, this is my opinion too, but even in, you know, mountain ultra trail running, people think, you know, there's not a lot of, relatively, a lot of money on the line or there's not a lot on the line that would, you know, be an incentive for people to use drugs. But... You know, there's definitely incentive, and part of it's the ego, just getting the ego, the publicity, attention maybe, but there are international travel perks, there are sponsorship dollars, not just in product, but, you know, bonuses and, and cash that, you know, could make you, make someone's lifestyle really change, and so I think, you know, that's plenty incentive. Yeah. And like you said, it's kind of just human nature, like, you know, people look at cycling and they're like, oh, you know, Lance was working with millions of dollars on his contracts, and... The glory of, of winning the Tour de France or something like that, but uh, you know, just for winning a big trail race, I could see that you know some people might uh, consider using performance enhancing drugs to to get that edge. Yeah, you know, and a lot of you know that always comes up too. You know, there's no prize money or very little, but um, you know, there's what I call safe money, and that's contract money. Um, now, if you're winning multiple races, then you know there's a good chance that you land a pretty good contract and, and be able to you know pay your rent and um you know do quite well and that's the money you want because that lasts all year it's not just a one-off you know kind of like check and um you know if you can consistently get good results um then that's what you're going to get and you know the one thing too with trail running is it, it kind of puts you in a place where it's almost perfect you know these guys um you know they, they disappear especially you know like there's a few guys in Europe I know they, they disappear in their caravan and and they're training in the mountains. And no one can get to them and nobody knows where they are and they come back super fit and, and they're ready to go. And you know, you you kinda of think, Wow, yeah, they've been training hard, they've been in the mountains but no drug testers been able to catch up with them, you know. They're only ever gonna get tested if they do, you know, at races and they know it's coming. So you know, it, it if you're gonna cheat Trial running, I think, would be the easiest one to get away with it. Um, just because of where you are. You're not at the local track. The drug tester can't roll up in the middle of your workout. Yeah. You know? And what do you think about, like, substances? I mean, I, I don't know <laughs> how uh -huh. knowledgeable you are. Just being in the running world, though, you hear things like EPO and testosterone, HGH. Uh, there's probably 20 other things that I don't even yeah. know about. I've been doing a little digging online, just trying to find out, you know... And these like bodybuilder forums and cycling forums and these guys just throw around things that I have to look up, you know, like what is this? It's a variant of EPO and there's 20 different ones out there and, mm. you know, they're they're not tripping tests because it clears your system overnight basically. And uh, it's not just the blood bags and all this, but just doing extra stuff. I mean, what do you think? You think EPO would be the main thing that would help in, in trail, not ultra trail running or? You know, like... I guess, you know, like be able to carry more oxygen um, constantly, which is basically what EPO does. Um, mm. You know, I, I kind of, I enjoyed 
following the cat and mouse game um, and so I'm probably a little bit more knowledgeable than uh, you know the average Joe but um, there's so many things out there I remember when I was in Sydney at the Olympics they um, you know they reckon that the, the guys inventing the drugs were 20 steps ahead of the drug testers you know and the drug testers you know people think that they're there to keep the sport clean and um, the big thing is they're there to protect the sponsors you know the sponsors don't want to look bad you know like these huge companies that are dropping you know millions and millions of dollars to sponsor the Olympics and, and you know like use the footage to, to help boost their brand you know they don't want people getting busted for drugs and, 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 and dying you know during competition because they're so jacked up um, and that's basically how drug testing started you know they, they went to a lawyer and the lawyer you know put together a plan and and now that lawyer, you know, is, is the head of drug testing for the world. So uh, it's it's interesting stuff. I think the easiest way to kind of like get your head around it is, um, you know, I used to follow Victor Conte, mm -hmm. and um, you know he's been on both sides of it. And uh, right now, you know, he, he basically tries to out everybody that, that in his opinion, are, are, are doping or what they're taking. And, and you know, he he's got a lot of information, and you know, it's it's. It's interesting to follow, like you said. You know these things that pop up that, that are incredible, and they, they change your, you know your body so much. And and you know you can't forget too that if you know if you're on EPO or human growth hormone or stuff like that, um, you've still got to train really hard. But it just allows you to be able to train super hard every day, and and that's how your body you know reacts to it, and, and it gets better and stronger and faster. Yeah, it's like you hear is like. Well, this is I don't know anything about bodybuilding, but like you know, people are like oh yeah, you just take you take steroids and less testosterone, and you're going to be jacked. But the reality is that you just have you have to lift like crazy because the steroids allow you to just recover that much faster and to build that muscle mass. But you still have to you know destroy yourself in the gym or whatever. So you, you know, you take that to running, and you you still have to train to get quads of steel or to you yeah know, work your cardiovascular system. And, you know, having you know, you see, it was a cycling or a documentary um, about this reporter who was a, kind of an amateur cyclist, but he decided he'd, he'd order EPO online from China, uh, which I don't think is as ex expensive as people think. I've heard you could get a good supply for about $1,000. Um, I don't know the I'd prices. be surprised if <laughs> it cost that much. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it's really not, you know, <laughs> people like, you have to be super rich. No, you don't have to be super rich to get EPO from China. He got it tested in a lab. It was legit stuff. And then he was also on a biopassport system with uh, World Anti-Doping Agency. He's, administ he's taking this himself under doctor supervision, but he doesn't tell the drug test testing agency. And within seven weeks, he had his 8% boost in VO2 max and his cycling performance just skyrocketed where he's going out for century rides back to back. Uh, and, and he didn't even trip the biopassport when they tested him. Yeah. They thought he was normal but he's microdosing EPO so that just shows how easy it is for someone with a little bit of basic science knowledge and an internet connection yeah. can can get something as high powered as EPO and obviously there's tons of other PEDs out there and, and gray area TVs and, and all that but yeah EPO it seems like would be is, is a big one they, re they reckon yeah if you get busted for EPO that you're just an idiot you know yeah. it's, it's that easy to you know kind of microdose and get, and get past it and in and out of your system and, and things like that. Yeah. It's yeah, it's shocking, but it's real, you know. And, and you know, you might want to you know, bury your head in the sand, but it's <laughs> happening. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I yeah, know just from racing, I didn't have a great professional road racing career like like you did, um, or track racing for that matter. But you know, there were guys that placed ahead of me in, in little road races that ended up getting busted yeah. uh, for things like that. American guys and. Uh, yeah, and, and they, you know they get busted, and it's like, oh, I, I knew that guy, and I always wondered how he would beat me, yeah. <laughs> kind of. And so it always made sense in, in hindsight. But yeah, I mean, he, he sometimes the, the person be a really nice person, but that being a nice guy has nothing to do with it. Really, that's the best argument. Yeah, yeah. like oh, but they're so nice. It's like yeah, it's because they know they're gonna win. You know? <laughs> of course, they're gonna be friendly. They're gonna beat you. Yeah, yeah. I I don't know. Like I said, it's got to come back to the love. If, if you don't love it. And you don't love going outside and, and, and putting in those miles. You know, that kind of stuff will just beat you down. And, and you get depressed and then, you know, you'll hate the sport. And then, you know, basically they've won. Mm -hmm. You know. What are some signs that you've seen 
with people do like you mentioned like they could they recover faster or they maybe they race well yeah it, it's hard to say oh these are the signs to look for but yeah. you know like typically you know guys that I've seen that have you know been busted mm -hmm. you know they tend to kind of train by themselves a lot mm -hmm. um, you know and you hear stories of these amazing workouts and um, you know they just there was this one guy in a race I was in and you know I beat him somehow and he looked like he was like yeah at least 20 pounds overweight then the next <laughs> week you know, we ran a 10k and I was tired from the weekend before the 5k and um and he he blazes off and he sets you know as a national record he was a foreigner and um and he just didn't even look like a runner he was just so big um you know not that you can't you know be big but you know at a certain level you know people start to kind of resemble the same shape and the same size and, and stuff like that and you know this guy's running 27 20 27 30 and, and he he could have been like you know a, football player he was pretty big well wow. and then you know then it comes out you know he's been on epo and for the longest time and, and and stuff like that and you just it just blows your mind um but i don't know i think it comes down to it if it's if it's too good to be true then normally it's not true yeah you know makes sense <laughs> yeah um so yeah you know closing out uh you know drug testing is only going to be as good as it's going to be even in a, a sport like cycling where those guys are tested all the time you know lance armstrong tested hundreds of times yeah. uh he you know maybe he trips a couple positives but those get covered up because there's a lot of corruption but the other the other times he's testing clean maybe um because he's they're microdosing or they they know when the tests are coming or they they time it whereas yeah in mountain ultra trail running i mean it's it's <laughs> you either know a test is going to be happening at a race or you know they're only going to test you during a certain window so you know moving forward i don't know how we could keep the sport from getting like cycling or you know keep yeah. it more pure and natural because it's it's definitely not 100 percent clean right now it's, in it, my opinion yeah well you know I, i'd probably agree with you um but yeah like i think the only way there's going to be more drug testing is if you know not if but when the sport progresses too you know and it gets a little bit more professional and it starts kind of like going along that same trajectory as as, as marathons did you know they mm -hmm. used to be kind of podunk marathon races but now everybody's kind of got their act together and and you know they're they're well organized and, and they've got sponsorship and they've got dollars and, and they are able to make it you know a great kind of event where trail running still, you know, you've got that, that half that, that want to keep it old school and, and, you know, just a bunch of guys getting lost down the woods. Um, but I think that, you know, to, to kind of combat this top end of the sport, you know, they need to start marking themselves a little better. Um, you know, opening up the fields as, as much as they can and, and, you know, maybe putting, you know, prize money for, for those top guys and inviting those top guys. and. And, and creating more media so then they can generate more dollars to put into kind of that drug testing and stuff. Um, you know, and that's one thing too that I like about Leadville is that they're on their way um, and they're doing well. You know, they're, they're not like struggling for, for sponsorship because a lot of people want to be a part of the race that's, that's growing and, and doing really well. Um, you know, they've had their hiccups, but uh, you know, I think that they, they sit down every year and they try and, you know, get through that. And, you know, like, it wouldn't surprise me if if that's probably one of the first races to get, you know, a good amount of prize money and then, you know, bring in drug testing. Um, and, you know, there's lots of races in, that are in that same kind of category that are doing that. But uh, I think that's the only way that, that, that we're going to we'll see it. You know, I haven't seen one drug test since I've been doing this and it's been, what, about five years now. So. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. I've been tested twice in the last four years. Where was but that? But it was at uh utmb okay so they test Europe. runners before the race but everyone knows it's coming yeah um, <laughs> prepare. <laughs> and then uh after the pikes peak ascent when it was a world running mountain okay championship yeah. event so but you also know that's coming because if you do well you're gonna get tested uh and it's on the it's basically on the day of the race so um i think you know for testing to be even semi-effective it's gonna have to be surprise in the off season you know yeah if i had it my way it would be in the middle of the night but yeah no like <laughs> you have to you, when you know it's coming i, I hear that it's it, it's easy enough to get around um mm -hmm. but you know i've heard stories too like you know guys will be at the track in europe and they'll have a lookout and 
you know, they'll, they'll see the drug tester pull out and the, the lookout will kind of alert the coach and the coach will just, you know, scream out instructions. And, um, you know, I've, I've heard stories legit that were, of guys that were there. See, you know, 1500 meter runners doing a workout. The coach, you know, gives them the sign that the drug testers have pulled up. They just hop the back fence in their spikes and just sprint off down the street. Oh, man. You know, crazy stuff like that. You're like, seriously, that, that <laughs> happens? But, yeah. you know, it's it's a cat and mouse game. You know, yeah. They're trying to make... You know, make a life for themselves, make some money, get some, you know, like, reputation and, and, and you know, a little bit of fame and, and the, the drug testers are there to try and keep it keep it even, so... Uh. Oh, man. Yeah, I just finished reading Tyler Hamilton's book, uh, The Secret Race, and he talks about, you know, the drug tester knocks on your door and you either hide and just make him come back later or, like, they'd inject a, a bag of a uh, saline solution into their bloodstream to thin out their... To bring it down, yeah. yeah. bring down their hematocrit because um, they'd been on EPO and HGH and testosterone. And it, it happens, man. <laughs> I heard of a lady in Boulder, drug testers knocked on her front door and she jumped out the back window and hid oh. in the bushes. Yeah. Oh, man. And she was a good runner. That's so, crazy. So, yeah, it, it's happening. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, to close out, I guess, you know, it, it comes down to personal accountability and just doing your own thing and just trying to, you know, plain hard work uh, to see what you could do in the sport because I think that's, you know, money aside and lifestyle changes aside and all those travel perks and gear perks and sponsorship dollars, uh, you know, we're, we're just trying to see what, what we could do on a course and, you know, compete to the best of our ability with what, yeah. what's been given to us. And, it, you know, I think it, it, it comes back to, like I said before, you got to love it and you've got to do it for the right reason. But, um, you know... Something happens when you, you start kind of performing well and you, you get to that high level and you lose sight of, you know, why you started it. You know, and if, if a lot of the top guys, you know, had that same perspective as, as the mid-packers, the people that just have that challenge set for them, then, uh, you know, those are the, that's the mindset that, that, that we all should have, you know, when you go into race. I just want to better myself. I want to, you know, push my limits and I want to make it as hard as I can for everybody else. Um, but, yeah. I don't know, humans, man. Money, fame. Yeah, it's just uh, human nature, more of a people problem almost. But you're, that was a really good point, though, with, uh, you know, going back to the roots of, of maybe why you started running or, you know, looking at, at runners who, you know, a lot the the bulk of ultra trail runners, the mid-packers, or, you know, even in, in marathons, you know, people doing it to challenge themselves and doing it for the right reasons, to gain fitness and... You know, ultimately, if you're cheating with performance-enhancing drugs, you're really just cheating yourself. So, uh, yeah, you gotta you gotta be able to wake up and, and look at yourself in the mirror, I suppose. Um, yeah, crazy, crazy stuff. Yeah, but uh, thanks so much for for taking the time for being on the show and uh, talking about your history in running as well as <laughs> the issue of PEDs and uh, just all your experiences in there. I mean, it's just if you don't follow Mike Ish. Uh, Google search his name, running. He's got some great articles online from uh, your running career and just uh, being a total badass and training like a madman to, to make the ultimate goal of <laughs> making the Olympics and, and then even doing ultras. So a uh, really impressive running career and, and a strong work ethic and a great all-around guy. So uh, thanks so much for nah. being on the show. <laughs> thanks for having me, man. It's cool. All right. And uh, stay tuned for more Sage Running Podcasts.